Professor Verhoeven was the intellectual leader of the project and also editor of the book. And he will be giving you a snippet of the book uh, tonight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Harry Verhoeven. Thank you so much, Mehran, for those uh, very generous and kind words. It's been a real pleasure uh, to work with the entire team at the center, especially Mehran, but also a special word of thanks uh, to Susie. I don't know where Susie is. I think Susie is right there, who has been incredibly useful to me as the editor, but most importantly, perhaps, to all the authors who have contributed to this, uh, to this work. And I'm also very happy to say, where is he sitting over there, Afiari Elmi, my good colleague and friend at Qatar University, who's contributed a very important chapter in this book uh, that I'll mention later, about, which deals with, with illegal fishing and piracy and the dynamics between the Horn of Africa and uh, the Middle East. Now, looking at the subject of environmental uh, politics in the, in the Middle East, in many ways it's a very obvious subject, yet in other ways, as I will try to explain to you, it is not. And perhaps to give you an intuitive sense of what I mean by that is, uh, take a look at this, this photo. This photo is taken in what is officially designated as the most polluted town anywhere in the world. And polluted here is as defined by the World Health Organization, particularly re re referring um, <clears throat> to a number of particles known as PM 2.5. And the city is the city of Zabol in eastern uh, Iran. Now, the city of Zabol is usually referred to in these terms, very unfortunate, as the world's most polluted city, something, as you can imagine, that the Iranian government is not terribly keen on. But usually this is a problem that is framed as the result of night daily dust storms, as the result of unchecked urban expansion, and as essentially a problem caused by the uh, consumption behavior of the ordinary citizens, the ignorant ordinary citizens and residents of the city. Now, this is, of course, one way of looking at the issue and trying to account for the fact of why a city of about 100,000 people has about 700 uh, people every year who die of pollution-related diseases such as uh, tuberculosis. Another way of thinking about this issue is trying to draw attention to a number of other crises that are also affecting Zabal and that may well be more important than the consumptive behavior of a number of ignorant locals. One of them, very importantly, is of course the sanctions regime under which Iran has been suffering for the last four decades as imposed by the United States of America. Another is global climate change, which is, as many of you will know, it hitting the Indian Ocean region particularly hard, and it includes rainfall patterns and water flow patterns of Zabal. But another and perhaps most crucial one is the fact that Zabal draws most of its water resources from the Helmand River which comes from Afghanistan, yet most water in Afghanistan these days goes to the cultivation of poppies to make opium and then, of course, henceforth, heroin. And in that sense, Zabal's is really at the center of a whole range of dynamics, regional and global, that might well be much more important than some of the consumptive behaviors of a number of supposedly ignorant uh, locals. Now, I say this, as I said, because uh, when, when one raises the issue of environmental issues in the Middle East, on the one hand, as I said, this seems obvious. And this is a region in which ideas that the environment and the sheer nature itself shapes political and economic and social outcomes has long been intuitive. There's perhaps no better illustration of this than the old saying that Egypt is a gift of the Nile, as if the mere fact that water flows down from the Ethiopian highlands and from Lake Victoria in Central Africa all the way to Egypt in and of itself would explain all the political and the social processes that have been happening or occurring in this country. They most certainly do not, but yet nevertheless this idea that somehow the environment, as an, in social science terms, as an exogenous and independent variable, shaping the dependent variable, that is to say political, social, and economic outcomes, is one with a very long uh, history. And it is one, of course, that we can trace back to many great intellectuals, Western, and from this region as well as from other regions, such as this man over, over here. Now, it's of course important to, to point out that some of the first thinking about this idea, this idea of environmental det determinism, um, that fundamentally environmental outcomes fundamentally shape political and economic thinking, goes back to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle already had the idea 
that in certain types of landscape, in certain types of topography, certain types of political civilization would emerge. Aristotle explained that in the flatlands, in flatlands where there's not, much, where there's not many mountains, not many hills, you would more naturally see egalitarian societies uh, emerge, whereas in more hilly societies and more mountainous uh, civilizations, aristocracy and more hierarchical systems are present. Now, this kind of thinking also underpinned the writing of this man over here, Ibn Khaldun, perhaps the greatest scientist, the greatest thinker of the 14th century of, uh, the, of the common uh, era, Ibn Khaldun, who wrote many things, but is perhaps best known for his ideas about the links between climate and types of society. Ibn Khaldun divided the world in seven different types of climatic zones, each of which had a specific outcome on the kind of social organization, the kind of culture, and the kind of political outcomes associated with it. And Ibn Khaldun essentially argued that the reason why Northern Europe, in his mind, seemed to lag behind the Arab world at that moment in time was because Northern Europe had to deal with colder climates, whereas Central Africa, which is very hot and very tropical, had to deal with, with climates that are much too, uh, much too extreme for human flourishing. But that the Middle East and the world in which he grew up was actually ideal for those purposes. So the idea here fundamentally is that climate, the environment as an exogenous variable, shapes human uh, outcomes. You also see this when Ibn Khaldun applied this analysis very specifically to the two societies he roughly distinguished in the Middle Eastern world. On the one hand, the world of the nomads, who were living in the desert and were therefore harsher and more martial, and the, the world of the city dwellers, who could live in relative luxury and abundance, but over time would therefore become complacent and face decay, and therefore would over time be replaced by those people coming uh, from the desert and who would overthrow them. And he saw history, therefore, as a cyclical um, as a cyclical process in which new elites, uh, shaped by the climate and the environment out of which they came, would come to replace uh, the old ones. Now, interestingly, Ibn Khaldun's ideas were also used, or perhaps I should say abused, by European colonialism in this part of the world. European colonialism, for example, in places like Algeria, very strongly drew on ideas that environment conditions political outcomes too. And similarly, that political and economic mismanagement could lead to environmental decay and might therefore explain why some parts of the world had fallen behind other parts. The classic British and French explanation as to why the West was richer and more powerful than uh, certain parts of North Africa and the Middle East, in part was an environmental explanation. When one reads the chronicles, certainly of the French colonization starting in 1830 in Algeria, one is struck by the repetition, incredible amounts of repetition of how the French essentially blamed the local population for mismanaging natural resources, and they essentially argue that colonialism is an entirely legitimate venture because it has far greater knowledge and a far greater understanding of these scarce resources and is thereby making a contribution to humanity, to civilization as a whole. French civilization measured itself to the extent that it was able to control the environment. In the case of Algeria, for example, there was an obsession with malaria and with disease. And there was a belief that French colonialism would only be successful if it managed to conquer that disease and, for example, develop a prophylaxis for malaria so French civilization could penetrate more deeply into the heart of Algeria and by a greater extension Africa. Hence, of course, why you get the very famous French hygienist and leading colonial thinker, Jean-Noël Perrier, as saying that colonizing is sanitizing. At the end of the day, colonialism is nothing else but the responsible management of natural resources, huh, even when local people do not understand why we are undertaking this venture. It's very interesting that people like Perrier drew very explicitly on Ibn Khaldun, saying, we didn't even invent this kind of thinking. It's the kind of thinking that existed here for a long time. We are merely bringing back this wisdom to uh, the shores of North Africa. Now, this line of thinking, environmental determinism, is still very present in the two dominant patterns of the links between the environment, economic development, and politics. And the first uh, <coughs> instance in which you see this very clearly is a line of thought that I would describe as technocratic environmentalism. And this is essentially a line, of, a line of work that declares itself to be resolutely apolitical by just trying to focus on environmental facts in a strictly scientific manner and by using the rigorous scientific method, that is to say, one first observes one then intervenes, one then carries out the diagnosis, one then evaluates the entire, entire cycle, and one then 
go back to observing uh, once again. In the words of Jeffrey Sachs, perhaps the world's most influential development economist, huh, what he proposes huh, is a profession of rigor, insight, and practicality, huh, a strictly apolitical, positivist manner of approaching the environment and trying to isolate the exogenous variable that is responsible for social, political, and economic uh, change, and one then tries to intervene uh, based on best practices. Now, this is a model of studying the environment and intervening in the environment that is resolutely against the idea of participation. It is expert-led in the sense that it believes that knowledge can be accumulated, that some people know and other people do not know, and that authority should be delegated to those who understand, uh, in colonial terms, to the so-called savant, uh, those who literally know. Now, you see this very, very <clears throat> vividly, for example, in the organization, an organization called Ikanga, and they fell in the realm of agriculture and water management uh, particularly influential. ICARDA stands for the International Consortium on Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, historically headquartered in Aleppo, in Syria, with 600 of the best agricultural and water scientists brought together in the city, working together on trying to provide Middle East-wide solutions to food and water issues. It is ICARDA that also underpinned the very rapid expansion of mechanized agriculture in Syria in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s, very controversially, both by expanding the areas under cultivation, but also very importantly by massively increasing the amounts of water consumption. And there's quite a few people, and we'll return to this later, who blame Icarda in part for helping to cause uh, the civil war in Syria from 2011 onwards. Uh, but so that's the first model of thinking about it. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positivist, science-based model that clearly separates human values from, from science. Now, a, very, a second very influential way of thinking about the environment, about politics and development, is a far more pessimistic tradition. It's a tradition that goes back to the English Reverend Thomas Malthus, who famously or infamously, depending on your point of view, warned that the human capacity to keep up with the demands of human civilization was limited, that there are limits to growth and that there will come a point where population growth outstrips agricultural growth and that the only way, therefore, that we can keep Earth in the balance is unfortunately through a combination of famine, war, and disease. And echoes of Thomas Malthus are still very visible and very audible today, especially in the discourse that I've tried to uh, depict here, of so-called water wars or climate wars. The idea that when societies or entire regions run out of water and food, they irredeemably are on a path to war, to fight each other in some kind of zero-sum uh, final uh, endgame uh, that will claim the lives of many people. Now, when one actually thinks about this issue of water wars, the intuition underpinning it is what is known in the development literature as the tragedies of the commons. It's the idea that certain resources are finite and they are shared, is that in a context of open access, without any restrictions to how much I may consume of this resource, that the world, and certain communities in particular, will exhaust the resource. Just to make this a bit more concrete, imagine a water well, and if we're all members of a community that share that well, without any restrictions on how much each of us can use, all of us individually have an incentive to take as much water as we possibly can. But the moment you all begin to notice that I'm sucking as much water as I can out of, out of the well, you too will try to do the same thing. And so over time, this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What from an incentives point of view makes perfect sense for the individual is catastrophic for the community. Now this idea of the water well running out of water due to the selfish but entirely rational behavior of individuals essentially underpins this kind of thing. In political science terms, it's the, essentially the idea of Hobbes that man is a wolf to another man, and that without restrictions, man will build his own grave and essentially destroy all of us, but then graft it on an environmental context. People who believe in water wars and climate wars are essentially telling you that they need some kind of leviathan, some kind of external central authority that limits our consumption of environmental resources and that protects us against ourselves. Now, as you will have noticed, both in this paradigm and in this paradigm, the idea of ordinary people is not very popular. Both dominant tropes fundamentally assume that there are some people who know and who deserve authority and control over knowledge, 
and then there are others who do not, whose behavior is ignorant, is unscientific, and should be restrained. It is not a coincidence that both sets of ideas, well, actually, the colonial idea, the post-colonial idea of technocratic environmentalism, and the current day idea of water wars and climate wars have underpinned authoritarianism. If you really believe these things, if these are really the values and the worldviews that you adopt, it is only a very small step to suggest that power, that authority, the distribution of these resources should be centrally organized at the hands of an authoritarian and a strong government. That is not a coincidence, of course, that we've seen many Middle Eastern governments in particular repeat these kind of tropes, both at international fora and vis-a-vis -vis their own populations. And there's perhaps no better example of this than the quintessential environmental crisis stage, Egypt. Now, ancient Egypt in particular is a, is a fascinating case study. In the book, I briefly refer to it. I've done a lot of scholarship on this in the past. But the writing, and very importantly, the rewriting of Egyptian history to fit the kind of environmental narratives I've been referring to makes a great case in point. Today, when you consult most popular history books on ancient Egypt, you will be told that the pharaohs were all powerful rulers, that they were demigods or actually living gods who centrally controlled most of the economy, most of the culture, and most of the politics of ancient Egypt. That the construction of the pyramids and the legendary temples and all these necropolises around ancient Egypt was only possible because of this strongly centralized model of control. And the intuition here is very simple. Egypt is a gift of the Nile. 97% of water consumption in Egypt means consumption from the Nile. It is too risky to allow this to individuals or to communities to decide consumption levels themselves. Therefore, the pharaoh had to centralize power. Except that what I've just told you is utter nonsense. There is not a single shred of evidence in ancient Egyptian history to suggest that ancient Egypt was actually an authoritarian state in which the consumption of water was limited and in which it was a state that undertook big hydro-infrastructural construction like big dams or big canals. In ancient Egypt, there was not a single dam constructed, no single one. Centralized, irrigated agriculture in Egypt began at the very end of the New Kingdom, that is to say at the very end of the highlights of Egyptian civilization. For many thousands of years, Egypt thrived exactly for the opposite reasons, because it had a decentralized model of production. The pharaoh and his administrators never tried to micromanage how much water an individual farmer could take. They never told communities, grow weeds, or grow sugar, or grow barley, or grow whatever. There were no central edicts. Farmers were trusted by the political authorities. They believed that farmers themselves best understood what the environmental and economic circumstances of that moment in time were and that they could best adapt dynamically to the changes in the annual flood. The Nile is a river in which the annual flood changes from year to year. The great secret, the reason why ancient Egypt was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, why it was able to export food across the eastern Mediterranean, was the very opposite of the reason you have been told. And why were you told that ancient Egypt was a centralized state with an all-powerful pharaoh and with an interventionist bureaucracy telling you what to grow. You have been told that because since the beginning of the 19th century, there is a very different political regime in power in Egypt. And that regime is embodied by the man who built modern Egypt, an Albanian mercenary turned Egyptian state builder, Mohammed Ali Basha. Mohammed Ali Basha had the dream of turning Egypt into a European life state, with a strong bureaucracy, with a strong army, and with a strong tax collection service. And in order to do so, Ali believed that the key to doing this was to extract as much surplus as he possibly could from the Egyptian farmer, to try to control and harness the waters of the Nile as much as he could through giant construction projects. And in the process, as he generated food, to sell this to the outside world and to use this money for industrialization, an early form, if you like, of import substitution industrialization. Now this idea, he didn't invent himself. He got this idea from a number of people who had invaded Egypt a few years earlier, and that were the French. The French, even after the withdrawal of Napoleon, left a number of scientists behind, the so-called savants, literally in French, 
those who know, people who sold Toscan walls to try to connect Egyptian history and the miracles of ancient Egyptian civilization with the modern miracle of the French Revolution. The French Revolution, which was meant to be universal and above all centralizing of political and economic power. And so ancient Egyptian history was rewritten by the savants and by Muhammad Ali's bureaucracy to suit the new pharaoh, the man who imagined himself to be the new leader and who needed history to essentially tell citizens, I know you don't like this, I know it's tough work, but this is the way it has always been. Egypt has always been an authoritarian state. There is simply not enough water to go around, and therefore you will accept my plans no matter how brutal or how destabilizing they are for you as people. Now, it's not a coincidence that to this day, of course, the Egyptian state and the Egyptian army dominate most of the consumption of water in Egypt. It is not a coincidence that most of the best land in Egypt is still allocated to, mili to the military industrial complex. This is where political power has been sitting for over 200 years. But this is essentially premised on what we call an environmental narrative. The storyline that seems to make intuitive sense, even if it lacks all evidence in actual, uh, all material evidence in actual, in actual fact. Now what the book does is try to unmask, to contest, to deconstruct some of the leading environmental narratives that we have seen emerging throughout this macro region. And it tries to show that many of these environmental narratives are not just the products of the Middle East, but almost always of the states, the societies, the markets of the Middle East in interactions with other parts of the world. In one particularly stunning chapter by a colleague named, named Ilya Gridnev, Ilya Gridnev examines another particularly harmful environmental narrative, namely that of the link between the consumption of charcoal here in the Gulf, including in Doha, and the reality of deforestation, of growing immiseration, and insurgency in another part of the world, in the Horn of Africa. And essentially, the scenario is very simple. The shisha you smoke, the grilled meat you like to eat here, or the grilled fish, the top quality charcoal to provide that consumption, those levels of consumption to you, tends to come from Somalia. The very top quality charcoal, if you talk to importers, to providers, most of the times it comes from Somalia. Now in Somalia itself, which has been a war-torn country with a failed state for the last uh, 27 years, unfortunately, this issue of, of the production of charcoal <clears throat> is unfortunately a major contributor to local environmental degradation. Huge amounts of forests are destroyed every year in southern and central Somalia in particular to essentially bring them to Middle Eastern markets. Now in the process, they don't not just return, uh, reduce the, uh, <coughs> the tree cover in southern and central Somalia, they make the land increasingly prone to erosion. In the process, they to chronic drought. Equally importantly, the trees that are cut in southern Somalia to enable this type of consumption, which seems harmless at first sight, is unfortunately majorly bad for the other import export of Somalia, namely livestock. Most of the wood used here is from the acacia tree. <coughs> and for those of you who know what, uh, what pastoralism and nomad nomadism mostly look like in this part of the world, a lot of animals like to eat at the leaves of the acacia tree. By destroying a large amount of forest in this part of the world, they, they contribute directly to the growing immiseration of pastoral populations. Now why is this able to happen? Why is this happening in a war-torn situation? It is because the belligerents the warring parties themselves are intimately involved in the taxation and the organization of the charcoal trade. That applies both to the jihadists of al-Shabaab, who even by the latest estimates of a UN panel of experts make more than $200 million every year in taxing the trade of charcoal out of their areas, but also very importantly by elements of the Somali government on the ground, who do not regulate this but are instead very eager for cash, and very importantly, also elements of the Kenyan Defense Forces, who are military presence in those parts of Somalia where deforestation is at its highest, where most charcoal is shipped out, is taken out, to come to the Middle East, and who in exchange taxes. In many ways, in other words, what you're seeing is not just a problem that touches the environment, or that immiserates local populations, importantly, it also sustains war. It is crucial to the war economy of Somalia. 
This is a map from the book that shows you some of the routes to which this happens. So most of the deforestation that happens over here in South Central Somalia departs from two crucial ports, officially controlled by the government. But the access roads controlled by al Shabaab, the jihadist movement. From there they leave to places like Aden, to Jazan, to Cairo, but above all to Dubai. Dubai is the regional distribution center where a lot of charcoal is collected and is then sold again to smaller retailers who then take it each to individual restaurants. This trafficking is entirely illegal. It is very well documented by the UN as a major source, as I said, of poverty, of war, of environmental degradation in uh, Somalia especially. But very little is done about it. One of the key reasons for this, as I've tried to suggest to you, is that when people think of environmental issues, they try to separate them from political questions and political issues. What this book tries to show and tries to argue is that the very way we think about the environment, the way we represent it, the way we claim to intervene upon it, is not an apolitical exercise. It is an exercise that is centrally concerned with questions of distribution. Who gets what? Who is accountable for what? Whose narrative is told and whose narrative is not told? Who has the authority to decide on where to call something an environmental problem, a development problem, or a security problem? And I conclude by taking another chapter from the book, which deals with protests in Turkey in 2013. Many of you may remember some of the protests that occurred in the context of the intended transformation of the Gezi Park in the European part of Istanbul in early 2013. And originally, many of the protests around this park ostensibly seemed to be about the debate about whether this park, which was built on a former Armenian graveyard and then military barracks was supposed to be turned, at least partially, into a shopping mall. And most of the protesters, at least this is what we were told by the media controlled by the Turkish government or close to the Akhwani party of then Prime Minister Erdogan, we were told that most of the protesters were bourgeois kids with too much time on their hands who were trying to protest something whilst this mall would create thousands of jobs and provide new opportunities to the poor residents of Istanbul. Instead, what ended up happening was that this handful of bourgeois, spoiled bourgeois kids were joined by more than 3 million other Turks in Istanbul, as well as in cities all around Turkey, to protest against the transformation of this park into a shopping mall. Because for most of these protesters, this was not simply about a park. And I read you here from the pamphlet that they spread, that they, that they distributed, to try to show just how central environmental concerns were to the growing economic cultural and political concerns they had about the direction that Prime Minister, now President Erdogan, was trying to take the country. As I said there, this is not about a park. A, it's about not being hurt. It's about the way decisions get taken in this country. There was no consultation of local residents about what, how happy or not they would feel about the disappearance of one of the last green spaces in this part of town. There was certainly no consultation with many of the poor people who were also using this park, or many of the ethnic minorities for whom the park, as I said in the case of the Armenians, had special significance because it had been a graveyard for hundreds of years. It's also about the abuse of state power, about the way in which certain groups of people are branded as enemies of the state, are criminalized and are shut out of media access, and whose claims are said to be those of the spoiled ones, or the undeserving ones, or the ignorant ones. It's about media being censored. It's about the trouble that we have in getting our message out. Protests around Gezi Park were not reported on in official media. They were essentially organized through social media, through the word of mouth, through people finding other ways of raising the issues that they found important. And very importantly, a huge number of people who participated in this were minorities. People who say that you know, whatever is happening in Turkey, that they cannot find themselves in the strong homogenizing tendencies of the Erdogan government, to create all, Tur all of Turkey and all Turks in his image. And for that reason too, this was not just a protest about the park, for them it was about democracy. The park and the state of Turkey's democracy could not be seen as separate things from the perspective of these activists, nor, as you can see here from the poster next to it, from the perspective of many other uh, people around the world who were joining these protests. Uh, in the word of, the, of one activist group in Athens, uh, when all that capitalism can offer is shopping malls, and in response to our protest asphyxiating gas, defending a park this turns into a fight for life 
for politics itself. And this is fundamentally the message that the book tries to get across. It is for you to understand that the, what the issues at stake here are not necessarily just environmental issues. Fundamentally, issues of power, of who has a right to say what, on which authority, and who is systematically, over time and over space, being excluded. Thank you very much. Thank you.